Good afternoon and welcome once again to the Catalan Committee Revision Sessions. As you can see here from the outline for the AS Spring 2024 session, we have four sessions for you. So uh, there's two for the Unit 1 Drama and Pro, so one session that looks at Section A and the second session that looks at Section B. And then you've got the Unit 2 Poetry section, which will be um, taken by my colleague Lucy Hacker, so you've got the poetry of section A and then obviously the section B with regards to your poetry as well. So there'll be four separate sessions for you to use, utilise and to um, use the revision tool as well. So my name is Mrs Cathy Davis. Um, I'll be taking you through the unit one drama and prose. So there'll be two different sessions, like I said. So this particular um, session is um, available or will be available um, if you go to the EES Skull uh, website um, and you go to Callum Cumbry and then the drop down menu recordings drop down and then you go across to the AS recordings. So that's where you will find these particular sessions. OK, so the content that we're going to be covering is essentially your examination paper. So those of you studying uh, English literature, you'll be quite familiar with the text that you're studying and hopefully the examination paper layout. So you've got um, a two hour examination, um, which consists of two separate sections. So one section based on prose, which is your drama, your, your novel and your um, second section, which is also um, one hour based on your drama text. So the vast majority of you are likely to be studying either Jane Eyre or Mayor of Casterbridge um, for your prose text in section A and for section B likely to be studying either Streetcar or Dr Faustus. Regardless of what text you're studying, if I don't mention your text, it doesn't make any difference because what I'm looking at today with you isn't, is, there's nothing really text specific, it's generalised skill based tasks. Um, and although there may be specific texts kind of noted with regards to resource materials, all of the resource and revision materials are also available for the, the other texts as well on the WJC website as well. OK, so just be mindful of that. So the purpose of this one session here, so looking at section A, is approaching um, your text um, and knowing how to get through a, an extract and looking at our prose as well. So the first um, part of this session will be something that you can apply to both section A and section B. So it's just going to be an overview of terminology and considering what we mean by prose, et cetera. OK, that's the that's what the focus is. And then we're looking at this idea of being able to engage in close analysis. So making sure that we are hitting the objectives when it comes to our analysis. And that would be applicable for both the extract part of your essay answer, um, your exam answer, as well as the essay as well. OK, so the skills that we're going to look at today or the terminology that you'll possibly be revising or even introduced to are things that should be applied or can be applied for both section A, the extract and section A, the essay for your um, for your prose text. OK, so just be conscious of that. So we're going to be looking at um, different genres initially to kind of explore how a text can kind of like show its ideas. So what you'll be given um, in a second, you'll have three different um, extracts and they're all based on the subject of home. So you will have um, say directions from a play. You will also have a poem and then you will have a prose text. So what we're just going to consider initially when reading the three extracts is the ways in which the different genres so you've got your, your play, your drama, you've got your poem and you've also got your prose text, OK, your, your novel. We're going to look at how they approach the exploration of the same subject. So it would be nice if you could maybe think about what techniques are unique to each genre. You could think about um, what is unique about the way each genre presents ideas about home. You could think about possibly um, what does one give or is anything taken away because of a specific genre? Um, 
we think about how each one is written as well. OK. The first extract that we're looking at is the drama extract, which comes from Arthur Miller's play uh, Death of a Salesman. Um, and it's simply a, what you simply got here are the stage directions that are being the, the house and, and how the house features here. So uh, we have um, we have here the description. So below us is the salesman's house. We are aware of towering angular shapes behind it, surrounding it on all sides. Only the blue light of the sky falls upon the house and fourth stage. The surrounding area shows an angry glow of orange. As more light appears, we are we see a solid vault of apartment houses around the small, fragile seeming home. An air of the dream clings to the place, a dream rising out of reality. The kitchen at centre seems actual enough, for there is a kitchen table with three chairs and a refrigerator. But no other fixtures are seen. At the back of the kitchen, there is a, a draped entrance which leads to the living room. To the right of the kitchen on a level raised two feet is a bedroom furnished only with a brass bed bedstead and a straight chair. On a shelf over the bed, a silver athletic trophy stand. A window opens onto the apartment house at the side. Behind the kitchen, on a level raised six and a half feet, is the boys' bedroom, at present barely visible. Two beds are dimly seen, and at the back of the room, a dormer window. This bedroom is above the unseen living room. At the left, a stairway curves, it, uh, curves up to it from the, the kitchen. The entire setting is wholly, or in some places, partially transparent. So we've got to consider this now, um, obviously being an extract from a play, the writer here is using quite detailed stage directions to sort of symbolise or explore this idea of home. You've got um, some points made here, this idea of towering angular shapes surrounding it on all sides in the opening sentence or two. And Miller describes the location here with this sense of oppression almost. So he's picking out words such as towering angular shapes behind it, surrounding it on all sides. So almost the sense that like he's unable to escape um, quite possibly. And then what we what we learn when we do read the play is that what is described here in place or home is pretty much representative of the main character himself okay so it's just a case of being mindful that the descriptions that you get in say stage directions um or in your in your prose text in your poetry whatever text you're looking at they're often there purposely to reflect something else if we look at the second extract then so this is the poem entitled Home is So Sad by Philip Larkin. Um, so he, he opens with Home is So Sad. It stays as it was left, shaped to the comfort of the last to go as if to win them back. Instead, bereft of anyone to please, it withers so, having no heart to put aside the theft. And turn again to what it started as, a joyous shot at how things ought to be, long fallen wide. You can see how it was. Look at the pictures and the cutlery, the music and the piano stool, that vase. So Larkin is able to do here in his poem what Miller cannot do in his stage directions, which is to almost personify the house. And here what Larkin does is he makes the house a, a, an almost sort of universal symbol. Um, and there is, when we are reading through this, initially, that kind of feel of like a, quite an idyllic almost um, sort of domesticated bliss with regards to life that's presented. But that's quickly removed in that second stanza where we have him talking about a joyous shot of how things ought to be long fallen wide. So what we're getting a sense of is this idea of the shot ought to be, OK, things that, you know, what should have been. Those words kind of destroy this idea of domestic, domestic bliss. 
And that phrase of long fallen wide suggests that it's kind of like falling short of the mark. Um, the expectations and what they would like to achieve isn't quite what they are what they are getting. OK, so using his his poetry, using his um, vocabulary choice here in order to kind of like destroy or diminish that idea of domesticated life. OK. And then the third extract that you've got it, like I said, is from a prose text. So this is a description of um, Gatsby's house by the narrator Nick um, from S. Scott Fitzgerald's novel. So I lived at West Egg, the well, the less fashionable of the two, though this is a most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between them. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sand and squeezed between two huge places that rented for 12 or 15,000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some, some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, with a tower on one side spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy and a marble swimming pool and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion, or rather, as I didn't know Mr Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore and it had been overlooked. So I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbour's lawn and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. OK, so here we get the description of Gatsby's house. Um, the whole section here is described by Nick, the narrator. So essentially what we're getting here as readers is Nick's opinion, his viewpoint. OK, so immediately what should be kind of like ringing in your heads as readers is do we trust this narrator? Um, we're going to wonder whether or not the narrator's own sense of maybe inferiority at having this tiny house um, in comparison to that of, um, of Gatsby's mansion, okay? Whether or not that is sort of inferiority and the eyesore that he says he has, okay? My own house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore, okay? Um, we wonder whether or not the narrator's judgment or own sense of inferiority kind of affects his views and affects his judgments here as well. Okay, so some things you could potentially consider. And then what we're just going to be looking at, like I said, is like a little bit of background, looking at like the purpose of prose and what we should be looking for. So as I said right at the start, these are skills that you should be applying to both your extract question and your essay. OK, so where we're looking at things like narrative voice, looking at themes, settings, images, OK, the types of things that we should be analysing, you're looking at that in the extract as well as in your essay, OK, but marked more sort of stringently or strongly for it with regards to weightings in your extract. So just a couple of little tasks I've kind of like weaved into this revision. Um, so just a little matchup activity. So looking at the different sort of uh, narrative approaches. So you've got things like uh, first person narrative, the self-conscious narrator, an unreliable narrator, third person limited, third person omniscient. OK, so and then there's the definitions that go alongside them. So all you've got to do is essentially match them up and then you've got the correct answers as well. OK, so. What we need to be thinking about is the way in which stories are being told and how it, they can be told in really two separate ways. So from content order, so the order in which the events in a story actually happen or the form order, so the order of events the narrator or the author choose to tell you the events. So it could be in flashbacks or some sort of fragmented sort of time order. OK, and what we need to be mindful of and be able to identify is the fact that the mismatch between content order and form order is often intentional. It's a strategy that's used by authors or a tool or a device used by authors in a bid to create this element of suspense, this element of mystery, and to kind of like 
get us in and engage us, <coughs> excuse me, and to challenge maybe our expectations. And the same applies to things like the chronology of events, okay, and the way in which the plot is selected and the way in which it's kind of an, the way it unfolds. So what we need to be mindful of is that the manipulation of the timeline occurs more often than it may seem. Um, and the narrative order of events kind of gives them a little bit more meaning. So when it comes to the nature of narrative, the types of things that we'd be looking at or you'd be expected to possibly make judgment on is this idea of narrative pace. So the fact that things are purposefully slowed down or purposely sped up uh, in an effort to kind of engage a little bit more, okay? So it could be slowed by, for example, focusing on minor events, or it could be accelerated by kind of compressing or making it seem lighter with regards to some major events, okay? So these are things that we could potentially think about. So you've got in front of you now is uh, an extract from The Catcher in the Rye, and um, what I'm going to be asking you to look at is the tone of the narration. Um, and tone is most definitely one thing that candidates sort of overlook or miss or fail to, to comment on. And it's something which is quite straightforward and you can get the sense of tone um, quite easily from reading. Possibly the first person narration is easier with regards to tone. But you can get a sense of like how that character is feeling or a sense of attitude and emotion through uh, through the reading. So if we have a look at this and I want you here while we're reading through it is think about and maybe jot down a few ideas with regards to the way in which Holden Coalfield, the character speaks here. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you probably want to know is where I was born, what my lousy childhood was like, and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me, and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it, if you want to know the truth. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all. I'm not saying that, but they're also touchy as hell. Besides, I'm not going to tell you my whole goddamn autobiography or anything. I'm just, I'll just tell you about this madman stuff that happened to me around last Christmas, just before I got pretty run down and had to come out here and take it easy. So he opens with um, that that sort of phrase about his childhood, this lousy childhood that he talks about, uh, and how our parents were occupy occupied and all before they had me, and all that David Coffee kind of crap. And even that kind of like reference and the language choice of that kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it. We get a sense that this character is being quite frank and being quite honest. Um, there's, there seems to be some sort of awareness as well of kind of um, how his parents would react. So he's very mindful of what he's saying. So there is that real sense of honesty. He describes his childhood as, as lousy and he also describes his parents as touchy. Um, so we do get that sense of honesty. But what we have to remember is that because the narration here is first person narrative, it's also a little bit limited and it's also possibly a little bit biased. So we do need to ensure that we are kind of bearing things like that in mind when we are dealing with kind of the narration approach and um, what we are learning um, and being able to show that we are considering those angles and aspects. Um, so you should be able to find it quite easy to pick on the tone of narration when analyzing a piece of first person prose like we were just looking at. So in this manner, we are being told the events of novels from one person's perspective. So you kind of get a sense of their voice as you're reading. When it comes to third person narratives, it's a little bit more difficult. So we need to just be conscious of whether or not the, um, the, the, the writer is using an omniscient or possibly limited viewpoint, or whether the speech is kind of neutral um, 
because often, like I was saying, it is often biased. Um, there could be a number of reasons. It could be a case of the author may be using the narrative to reflect their personal ideas, uh, the ideas which reflect the kind of opinion of society when the text was written. So almost using the text as like a mouthpiece um, to reflect the views of society. Um, the tone potentially could be um, sardonic, so used by the author to kind of mock certain characters, to mock maybe a set of values or an, an opinion, or possibly it can also be used in, in a way to kind of enlighten us and to, to give us more detail about something in particular. Um, it's, it's important that we realise that like the narrative voice is about how the writer is choosing to tell the story. OK, it's how the writer is choosing to tell the story. So that's the how angle that we have to be conscious of when we're analysing. So what are the conscious choices that the author made in constructing and putting together this story? And that's the same as the creation of, say, his characters or his or her characters um, as, as they go forward. OK. What we're going to have a quick look at here now are some um, slides which will have some notes for you. And there's some, it's just like a little sort of terminology test and literary terms test. But ideally, you should be using these terms in your analysis of language, because what these terms will allow is that you are kind of ticking those boxes for um, A01 with regards to your academic register and if you're able to identify some of the some of these you'd also be satisfying the criteria at A02 as well with regards to your ability to analyse the language choices and what the writer is trying to achieve. So a lot of these should be quite familiar to you. So you've got this first one where you're looking at the surroundings of the novels, it could be a time of day, um, it could be a historical period, it could be linked to the weather, so here you're looking at this idea of setting um, where you've got some form of repetition, contrast, pairs, frequent set of images. You've got use of patterns, um, whether the writer presents information in a realistically chronological sequence, uses devices such as flashbacks, time shifts. Here you've got this idea of handling of time, OK, the way in which the author does that. Um, the use of literal or figurative language um, can be through simple description or it could involve techniques such as symbolism, personification, simile, etc. So here's your use of imagery. Looking at whether the speaker's style is formal or colloquial, um, if there's a certain register that's used, OK? So you're looking at speech styles here. Um, the characteristic section of words used in a, in a in a work can be referring to semantic fields. So you've got this idea of your diction choices or your word choices, OK, vocabulary, um, how the stories are told. So the narrative point of view could also look at the degrees of knowledge. So here's your narration. Um, and then we're looking at this idea of remembering that figures are fictional devices, not real people and the technique that's used, so use of character and characterization. Um, and then here we're looking at the part of novels written as conversations, if it really happening in front of us as readers. Bear in mind this is a fictional representation of speech. So here you've got your use of dialogue. And then you're looking at the significance of beginnings and endings, the way important information is sequenced, the way it's withheld or revealed. OK, this is the control of information. OK, so those terms that we've just quickly kind of like dashed over, it would be an idea for you to sort of go back and revise those. So we're just going to pick out some of these in a little bit more depth now. So we're looking at what forms characterization. So the most common features that are used by authors when they are kind of creating and putting together their characters. So things that you'd be familiar with will be things like their names, um, use of dialogue possibly, um, maybe they'd have like recurring symbols or motifs that are associated with them, um, maybe they would be linked with a specific kind of like external environment or physical environment, okay, so these are some of the features. Um, 
when we're thinking about the creation of character, what we need to think about is like what we can learn from a really short piece about an individual. So what you've got over the next few slides, you've got this particular slide, which is Enduring Love by Ian McEwan. Then you've got a slide um, from the Curious, Curious Instant of the Dog in the Nighttime. And then you've got a slide from Jane Eyre, so Bronte's novel. So when you go through these three different examples of first person narratives, I'd just like you to kind of, as we're reading through them, just make a note of what your impressions of the speaker are. So simple things like, are you able, from this little section, no prior knowledge attached, are you able to figure out what the age is, possibly their sex, their social status, and what sort of clues or hints allow you to kind of find that information out? So uh, you are Enduring Love by Ina McCoon. We'll have a look at this one in a little bit of depth, and then you guys can obviously have a look at the others. So. I've already marked my beginning, the explosion of consequences with a touch of a wine bottle and a shout of distress. But this pinprick is as notional as a point in, in Euclidean geometry, as though it seems right. I could propose the moment Clarissa and I planned a picnic after I had collected her from the airport, or when we decided on our route, or the field in which to have lunch, and the time we chose to have it. There are always in antecedent causes. Okay. So you may have picked up on the formality of the speaker. So we flicked through those terms just now when we looked at this idea of diction choice, so vocabulary choices. So this particular uh, example, there's quite a lot of sort of formal language choices that are being made here. Um, for example, there's also like these this mention to things like um, antecedent causes and um, including geometry. So that's possibly suggestive um, of the character's education, okay? And then we've got this sense of him talking or them talking about this moment that they could have proposed to this female Clarissa. Um, so, there's a suggestion that the speaker, obviously here, may be male. And with those references to things like airport, wine, picnic, we get a sense that this speaker could possibly be both male and it could also be middle class. OK, so we've got then um, the second one. I'll have a quick read through it. But like I said, I'll let you have a look at it. So this is a murder mystery novel. Siobhan uh, said that I should write something I would want to read myself. Mostly I read books about science and maths. I do not like proper novels. In proper novels, people say things like, I'm veined with iron, with silver, and with streaks of common mud. I cannot con contract into the firm fist, which, the, which those clench who do not depend on stimulus. What does this mean? I do not know. Nor does father, nor does Siobhan or Mr. Jevons. I have asked them. Siobhan's long blonde hair and wears glasses, which are made of green plastic. And Mr. Jevons smells of soap and wears brown shoes and approximately 60 tiny circular holes in each of them. So you may click with this particular one that there's an individual writing or speaking who is a little bit sort of obsessive with regards to detail. So um, picking out individual things like, for example, the smelling of soap, 60 tiny circular holes in each of them. Okay, and if you read a little bit more of the text, if you're familiar with the text, you'd understand and appreciate why that is. So I just want you to have a think about who the speaker is here. Okay, what age do you think they are? Okay, so talking about possibly um, think about who Mr. Jevons is. Are uh, they maybe school age? Is Mr. Jevons the teacher in school? Siobhan possibly um, a friend from school. Um, she's clearly important to this individual. OK, so these are sort of things that you could be picking out. And then you've got the third ex extract here. Um, do you think because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, I am soulless and heartless? You think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And if God had gifted me with some beauty and much wealth, I should have made it as hard for you to leave me as it is now for me to leave you. OK, so again, we could think a little bit more. So there's a revelation about her um, 
social status. Um, she talks about her sort of maybe her beauty, her wealth uh, as well. Um, she reveals to us that she has this sense of soul and she's um, because she's plain and because she's obscure in their eyes that she's also without soul and she's sort of questioning their views and their thoughts okay so up until this point a number of techniques that we have looked at um are also relevant when we think about or consider the way in which dialogue is used to create character so what we can also look at especially with your extract question are things like the balance or the weighting of the dialogue choices so the dialogue that's expressed between characters so do we see one speaker dominating are there any um interruptions are they accepted interruptions are they perceived as rude and disrespectful and we've got to think about what the impact of those interruptions are okay we can also think about the use of tags and this is often very much kind of neglected in in analysis so you normally have an adjective or an adverb which kind of tags along with a dialogue, which tells the reader the tone of the speech. So, for example, she said with affection or said Peter, his tone malevolent. Um, we also need to look at things like the punctuation choices. You know, often the punctuation choice reveals a lot about how something is being said. So um, it doesn't have to always just be about what is being said, it's also how it's being said. Um, so looking at the, most, the, the importance of character within a prose text, okay, they often have multiple purposes. So um, sometimes they're used to allow us to evaluate themes, they're often used to develop other characters, um, and, they're, and they're often used to kind of drive or push the plot forward, okay? Um, some texts also have narratives um, and sort of characters that have been created for more serious purposes. So sometimes characters in texts are used to draw attention to a key idea or issue that the writer wanted to explore. I spoke earlier about this idea of it being some sort of like political mouthpiece sometimes is what characters used as. And this is what we could potentially refer to as this idea of authorial intent. So just want you to um, be able to reflect a little and to consider some revision tasks for you to do just to prepare and get yourselves organised for the exam um, that's that's coming now in May. So you've got a little bit of feedback here from the principal examiner that links to the extra question section. OK, so you'll be mindful that you've got 60 minutes for section A. So ideally you want to spend 20 minutes on the extract, 40 minutes on the essay. So one thing that we need to remember is that we are only being assessed AO1 and AO2 for your extract question. So that means that there's no marks for AO3, so your context doesn't feature, OK? Whether or not you think that the female in your text represents or fulfills the stereotypical role for Victorian female, that's irrelevant because we are simply looking at you answering the question, engaging with the question and showing good even coverage of that extract okay so the feedback is that pupils must engage closely with the extract um that you don't need a kind of a narrative retelling of the plot you have to remember and realize that the people marking your your work the examiners are very much familiar with the text and don't need you to re retell us the story uh, the reminder that there's no marks for AO3 for the context um that the better response to come to and write is technique so the terminology that we've just gone over, so things like setting, characterization, authorial intent, that's the technique, okay, as well as the connotation of language. Um, and remember that only 20 minutes should be spent on the extract response. So there's a couple of um, pointers as to how to approach reading an extract. Um, one thing we have to be really mindful of is the fact that the extract's been given to you as a whole for a reason. So there's very, it's very likely there's going to be something in the opening couple of sentences and something in the closing couple of sentences that potentially you should be commenting on or could be commenting on. All right, you have to ensure that you are showing that you're able to provide an even coverage and even analysis of the extract as well. 
So here you've got just your marking grid and you've got an example here of the sort of type of questions that you will have in, in the exam. So you've got here, as you can see, um, the extract question is here. So read the extract below and answer the questions that follow. So here you're looking at um, Mayor Castrobridge and looking at the character of Michael Henshard. OK, and then what you've got is an annotated example answer. And as you can see, OK, page and a half. This particular response is in an examination answer. And um, <coughs> this particular answer, um, I think, was a ban for response. So just be mindful. This is a really good example of making sure that you are able to track all the way through the extract, show good coverage and focus on the question. You'll also notice when you do look through that example answer that the um, language choices, so the evidence that's being selected by the candidate, they're very short and sharp. So they're precise and they're concise. So they're not putting in long lines of text. So they're not using, say, a line, two lines of the extract. They're picking out individual words and phrases and being quite selective. So what you've got here is another um, essay question, OK, extra question. So here's your question. So examine Bronte's presentation of Jane's state of mind in this extract. So um, you've got the extract there. And then what I would like you to do as, an, as a revision task is to read through the answer on the next slide and kind of look at what what you would say maybe in AO1 you could write you could maybe highlight in one colour an AO2 in another for example and the types of things that you could potentially um add to this or what also could be looked at is um the use of maybe fragmented sentence structure um you could look at possibly um the mind her mind playing over things desperation sort of for some sort of change as well as being shown here okay so um just as well just remind you with regards to the um essay question but we will focus on that a little bit more um next time um is just the order of it more than anything okay so reminder about the timing is what's really important um and just to be conscious of your written expression so just quickly, what you've got here are some sort of introductory sort of comparative judgment tasks. So you've got three different instructions looking at sense sensibility and um, one of the texts that you you may be studying. Uh, and all I want you to do is to have a think about which are the most effective. OK, so read through all three in introductions, which one begins to engage the best with the text or the task um, and then put them in a rank order. So here's them in uh, in rank order of how the how the examination board saw it as well. OK. So like I said, next session, so the section B essentially, OK, that we'll be looking at um, will be focusing more on the actual examination responses. But the skills, the techniques, the pros that that you've been introduced, pros techniques you've been introduced to today, and most definitely um, skills and techniques that it would it would be essential and very much beneficial to see them being employed and utilised in your um, question papers, okay, in your examination papers. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Um, so there'll be one more session for Unit One. Thank you.